talking about the appointed days of our almighty God. Um, but most importantly, uh, we're going to be covering the Zadok Priestly calendar, a uh, calendar that, that we feel is uh, extremely accurate and really perfect and precise when it comes to outlining these appointed days. Um, so if you guys are all okay with it, I'm going to open in a word of prayer, and we're going to dive right in. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day, this day um, that you have given us to rejoice and to be glad. Uh, we're thankful for this event, for this conference, uh, for Chris and Liz for putting this on, and for all the all the hands who have been helping and uh, allowing us all to enjoy one another, enjoy each other, and, and most importantly, to dig into your word with one, one another. Because as the scriptures say, iron sharpens iron, that's what we're all here to do. Uh, we're not here to... Um, just listen to any one particular person and way of beliefs, but we're here to, to challenge each other and to really study this out together, because that's what this is all about. It's, it's growing in our relationship with you and growing closer to you uh, through the blood of the Lamb. And we're just so thankful and excited to be able to do that. We pray in the name of Yeshua. Can we say amen? Amen. amen. All right, so like I said, this is the Biblical Feast, the Zadok Priestly Calendar, and we thank you all for having the interest to want to want to check this out. Um, so to start kind of in the beginning here, uh, it's always best to go to the beginning, and it's Genesis 1.14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate them from day and from night. Let them be for signs and for seasons, moed, which we all know is appointed times for days and for years. Um, so hopefully everybody's heard a little bit about the appointed days and, and what they are. We're going to kind of skip out on that right now and, and kind of really dig into the calendar a little bit. Um, if anybody hasn't heard of these wonderful appointed times, please seek us out after. We'd be happy to talk to you about those and, and how we see our Messiah Yeshua in every single one of those days. The biblical feasts, being children of the light, is a theme throughout Scripture, especially uh, that we see throughout the New Testament. It talks about being these children of the light. It says, again, Jesus Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We all want to be walking in the light. We don't want to be stumbling in the darkness. And we're going to talk a little bit about that more today. Proverbs 6.23 tells us, For the commandment is a lamp, the Torah a light. Reproof for discipline are a day, uh, a way of life. And Daniel 7.25 says, He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and law, and they shall be given into his hands. And this is, of course, talking about the anti-Messiah, who we know is coming. There was a foreshadowing of the anti-Messiah, and that's Antiochus Epiphanes, who we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but he, he was a foreshadow, and, and if the anti-Messiah is going to do away with the law or, or change the law, change, change things about the law, what will, anti or what will we see Antiochus Epiphanes doing in history, past, that may have changed what we know today? So in church, you know, we, we all thought of these as, you know, he's going to change Sunday service. We're not, we're not going to be able to worship him on Sunday. Right. As we come into Torah, we, we realize, okay, he's going to change the feast days. He's going to change the, the, the biblical Sabbath. But could it be even further than that? Could he have altered this calendar in a way where those who were practicing it, even at the time of, of Jesus Yeshua, were practicing it in an incorrect way? So that leads me to the frog in a boiling pot of water, because that's a, a great analogy for this. If a frog is in a boiling pot of water and you slowly turn up the heat, he's not going to jump out. He's going to cook himself from the inside out. Could that be what the enemy has done to us over these thousands of years? Could the enemy have slowly changed things just a little bit so that we don't realize what's being done? This leads us to our calendar testimony and really what pushed us on this journey. Um, these are just a few scriptures that really have, have led us to this. It says, Deuteronomy 29, 29, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever. Proverbs 25, 2 says, The glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of the duty of kings to search that matter out. Isaiah 31 says, Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left. So we need to make sure that we're walking in that way, walking in truth. And so what is that truth? We're going to discuss that a little bit more today. And I just wanted to quickly share, each of us are going to share our testimony of what brought us to this calendar, where we came from, the path that brought us here. So these verses were, were a part of it for me, you know, searching things out deeper and, and not just taking what others have said. And we're all here at this conference for that reason. So for me, back in 2016, I was... Uh, presented with the, the fact that, okay, 
the Messiah is probably going to return on one of these or around one of these appointed times. And I, so I really started digging into the calendar, and I looked at all these different calendars. And there were some really big questions, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that I just wasn't getting answers to from any of the calendar studies that I watched, from, from digging through the scriptures, trying to figure out why I wasn't getting these answers. And so at Sukkot in 2016, I said, Father, I can't figure this out. I can't figure out why these calendars all seem to have issues. They don't answer questions that I have, that I feel you're giving me. And I had I spent countless hours studying all these calendars. So I, I said, I'm going to drop this, and, but I'm just asking that you would show me your calendar before your next year starts. And then, so skip ahead to March uh, 19th of 2017. And <clears throat> Most everybody had already started their calendars, and I was kind of frustrated. I, I thought, well, I just, I haven't gotten any answers. And I had to paint my, my daughter's bedroom. It's a really big room. It was going to take me several hours. I'm not a fast painter. And so <clears throat> I'm sitting there painting, and I popped on a YouTube video on my playlist, and the first one that came up was about the priestly order, and I, I listened to it because I was thinking maybe I could I'd figure out when the Messiah was born, which is something I had been studying. That, that one was super hard to listen to, but then the next one that popped up started, it, it said Zadok Priestly calendar. I thought, hmm, I'll just try it. I'm just painting, I'll just listen. And as I listened to that calendar, it just ticked box after box after box after box and answered all of the questions that I had had that didn't make sense on the other calendars. And so I, I had noticed Zach seemed to say a couple of things that led me to believe he was looking into something like that. And so I sent the link to him, and I'll let you tell, or let him tell you his side of it. But basically, that was two days before the calendar year started on this calendar, and it was just confirmation. There were several really big confirmations um, that this is my calendar. This is what I want you to do. So what's amazing is Mike and I really didn't even know each other at that time. Um, we had connected through uh, the virtual house church on IEC TV, and it was kind of amazing that he sent this to me because. Little did he know that I was actually doing the exact same thing. I had been researching and studying uh, for four or five years the different calendars because I just wasn't convinced about all the information that I was presented. Also, little did he know is that we uh, were expecting our second son uh, to be born two months later, and the we, we feel that God had really given us that name already, and his name was Zach. And I had never heard that name associated with the calendar before, and when he sent that to me, it was like, wow, you know, this is, this is really cool that, that this name is associated with a calendar. And as I started listening to this video, much like Micah said, it was checking all these boxes and confirming the studies that I had been doing myself. And so our desire today is to really try and unite the body because there's so much division over the calendar and there really doesn't need to be because we're all doing our best. We're all striving to do what's right. At least we should be. We all should be striving to, to humbly be serving the Father with all of our heart. So here's some of the questions, and we're just going to rapid fire through them that really led us uh, to question the, the current calendars that are being presented. So, you know, what is a new moon, and how, how do we determine what that new moon is? Conjunction, crescent, full moon. There's a lot of different discussion with the moon out there. A moon cycle being 29 and a half days, if you multiply that out by a 12-month cycle, you get 354. 354 is not divisible by 7 but it's divisible by six, which is the number of man, which is just kind of interesting. A 13th month needed some years. You know, we saw this year was, was one of those years that, you know, people were starting their years month, you know, a whole month apart. You know, when is, when exactly are, are we starting these days? Lunar observation versus solar pre-calculation. How, how, where do we even start with all this? You know, the, this whole idea of, of people saying there's, there's, um, there's really no solid calendar in the canon. If, you, if you're just going by the canon alone, and we're going to touch on that here in a little bit. Um, and the fact, the biggest one for me was the Sabbaths and the feast days being on the same day. There was a year that I, I remember, it was a, a preparation day for the Passover, and I just started thinking about all of the details that go into preparing for a Passover. How much work actually would have to be done if we were keeping a true Passover. And if that falls on a, on a Saturday, on a, on a weekly Sabbath, he says over and over again how we are to not do any work. And so I was just conflicted in my spirit this one year about, man, how, how are we to rest 
but yet being preparing for the Passover at the same time. Uh, we're going to show you today how you know we, we believe that you would never have to ever worry about that on this calendar that we're going to be talking about. So Jubilee 636 was a was one that really stuck out to me. I don't know if you, anybody in here has really studied it as Jubilees a whole lot. If you don't believe in scripture, then um, we'll have a conversation about that here in a little bit. But <laughs> so Jubilee 636 says this. There will be those who assuredly make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the season and comes in from year to year, 10 days to soon. Remember what I said about 354. For this... For this reason, the years will come up upon them when they will disturb the order, make an abominable day a day of testimony, and an unclean day a feast day. They will confound all the days, and the holy with the unclean, the unclean day with the holy, for they all will go wrong as the months, the Sabbaths, the feasts, and jubilees. So this really stuck out to me because in my confusion with the moon and how the moon seemed to be causing so much trouble and so much division, jubilees really confirms that same thing. And jubilees says that if we are using the moon solely, it's going to disrupt us. It's going to change these patterns. It's going to bring confusion. We're going to talk about how the moon plays out because it has a very key and vital role. It's just not in months as we are taught. And last year at Sukkot, uh, it was exactly 10 days off mm -hmm. between the Sukkot that I would have been keeping had I not been on this calendar and, and the Sukkot that we did keep. And then also this spring, the first visible crescent was 10 days before we started our year. So just a few more things. You know, where does the scripture tell us to go out and sight a new moon? Where does scripture tell us to start a month with the new moon? Is this tradition or is this Torah? So let's talk a little bit about new moon versus new month here. So the word uh, chodesh, <laughs> the Hebrew word chodesh, is what's translated as new month. It's translated as new month 20 times. But it's, trans it's used 276 times, and you can see the word for moon, yeriach, is used 26 times. The context in both cases, if it's hodash, it's always referring to a month of time, and if it's yeriach, it's always referring to the moon, the celestial body in the sky. And we'll have, we have a few examples we'll put up on the screen here, but as you can see, like with hodash in the seventh month, it's talking about the month. And, and then we'll skip to yeriach, the examples in this case, it's referring to the moon. So in every case where those two words are used, it's always Chodesh for month and Yeriak for moon. And then um, you can see here, it's 254 times it's translated as month, 20 times again as moon. So why? Why did they translate it as, as new moon? Why did they translate it as new moon those 20 times and 254 times as month? Was there a bias there? What's the reasoning for that? And then finally, uh, Yeriak, again, it's, it comes from, this is something that we'll get into a little bit later, but it comes from a root word that actually means a lunation, a, a moon month, okay? And so a lot of people that keep, uh, that, that hear about this calendar, they think we're throwing the moon out, and some do, okay? But we believe that the moon plays an integral part in this calendar, it's just not for the beginning of months. Okay. There, there's specific examples even in scripture mm -hmm. where they refer to a, a lunar month, a lunar period of time. Because you can watch a moon cycle and you can keep time based on that moon cycle. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a chodesh, which is a specific month actually denoted by the Almighty God. And so where this really came into play for me in, in, in my studies was this idea of 12 or 13th months. Because I could not find a 13th month ever mentioned in scripture. But if you follow the moon, it's needed every few years. And it's absolutely needed, or we're going to be celebrating Passover in, in the fall, in Sukkot in the spring, and it's, we're all going to get backwards. So just a few examples here, 12 sons, 12 tribes, uh, there's 12 captains, 12 hours, 12 constellations, 12 disciples, 12 foundation stones, 12 gates. 12,000 from each tribe. And what's really amazing is that it says, in the New Jerusalem, there's 12 fruits on the tree of life for the 12 months. So when we're in a perfected millennial reign with a new heaven and a new earth, and, and we're in perfection, there's only going to be a need for 12 months, which is interesting. This is just a really cool uh, slide that Micah put together, but here's all the months <coughs> mentioned in Scripture. Months 1 through month 12, and how many times it specifically are mentioned in Scripture? Big one's month 13. It's never mentioned throughout Scripture. And you can dig and comb through all of Scripture, the extra-biblical texts, whatever it might be, you're not going to find mention of a 13th month. 
if we are following the moon, and it's vital for us to do every so many years, I think we would have seen it at least play out once or twice throughout the course of scripture, but we don't see it mentioned at all. So we're given most of the dates, as Zach talked about earlier, we're given most of the dates for Moeds and things like that, but as far as an actual calendar, it doesn't tell you in, in the canon how to start your year specifically. It doesn't tell you how to start your month with the understanding that Kodesh and Yariak are, are two different things, okay? Every time it says new moon, it's, a, it's Hodesh. So it doesn't, it, canon doesn't actually tell us how to start our month, okay? It just says it's just new month. And because if we understand that, that, that those are two different things, then we can't necessarily assume that we just look to the moon to start our month. We have to figure out what, what we're supposed to use. Okay, it doesn't tell us how many days are in a month, anywhere. It doesn't tell us any of that stuff, how long a year is. It doesn't tell us those things. So with no exact calendar given in the canon, then how do we know what our calendar is? And that's the journey that Yah has taken us down of, of looking into some other witnesses that confirm and work with canon, but, the, but they give additional information we haven't had. So if we cannot find this information in the canon that we're given, our question next is, what, well, what is scripture? And, and that leads to a lot of interesting debates, and I'm sure many of you in this room have had those debates and been on both sides, because I know I've been on both sides of the debate. So I just wanted to point out 2 Timothy here, that you know, Paul is talking about living a godly life in our Yeshua Messiah, that they were acquainted with sacred writings, and that all scripture is breathed out by God, and it's for training in righteousness. So if these books are leading us to be training in righteousness, could they be considered scripture? So in this passage from 2 Ezra, Ezra has just asked God how the people would know that his word, know his, know his word and be able to follow his commandments because it was just destroyed in the temple, okay? And he says in 40 days they wrote 94 suffering or books, scroll, scrolls, and then in the, the gold part at the bottom, it says, Keep the seventy last, that you may deliver them only to such as be wise among the people. For in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the stream of knowledge. Okay? So there is an additional set of books. There's 24 books that make up the Tanakh if you, if you lump the prophets together. Okay? There's an additional 70 books that are called scripture by Yah in this passage. And this book... Was, was in the canon up until 1789. Okay, it's, it's, it was in the King James Bible until 1789. There's 70 extra books, and what are they for? They're, those who are, who are, they're for those who are seeking the truth. I believe Enoch, Jubilees, some of the other things in the Dead Sea Scrolls are those books, or some of them. Um, Jeremiah tells us this, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us, but behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. Now, I don't want to send us all on a wild goose chase and say that everything is a lie and everything is a conspiracy, because that just wouldn't be true. But it also wouldn't be true to say that none of it is. Because we know that that is how the enemy works. He takes bits and pieces here and there. He will tell us 99 truths to slip in one false. And so that's why we need to be wise. We need to be cunning. We need to make sure that we are studying in the spirit and working together. So what is scripture? Well, it depends on who you ask, right? Because... We have the, the, the Jewish Pharisee Tanakh that was put together by Pharisee Jews in the 7th and 8th century. We have the Catholic canon, uh, which was formed at the Council of Nicaea. The Protestant canon, you know, the Reformation question mark there, was it truly reformed? What exactly was taking place? The Ethiopian canon, which has a ton of books in it, um, and, and different translations, you know, the Septuagint translation, the Masoretic translation. What are these different translations, and how have things been slightly altered to make words and phrases and you know, sentences and passages appear different than what the text is actually saying? So all of this leads us into the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which we're really going to you know, dig into with our understanding of the calendar. Yeah, and the Dead Sea Scrolls contain a lot of secrets. They, wrote, they have the entire cal calendar recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls of how they kept it. And, and I believe that those scrolls came from the temple. So we'll, we'll uh, get into that in a bit here. So Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they were found here, um, as we can see, in Qumran, which is uh, just north of the Dead Sea there. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the location and the composition of them here. Um, so what are the Dead Sea Scrolls, Micah? So the scrolls are found in modern-day Qumran. They were found accidentally by a shepherd in the region. He was just throwing a rock into a cave. 
They're found in 1947. Yeah, exactly. Uh, more found up until 1956. And the languages ranging are ranging from ancient Hebrew, or Paleo, uh, Aramaic, Greek, and, yeah, and Paleo Hebrew. So it's just interesting to note that it happened to be found at the same time that Israel became a nation. Uh, was not available to the public until the 1990s. So what were they doing with it all of those years? Uh, no Jewish or Israeli scholar was able to read the scrolls until two decades after the discovery. And it's interesting also to note that only Catholic, Orthodox, Orthodox and Protestant monks were allowed to view from 1948 to 1967. Again, why? So they're made up of 900 to 1,000 fragments, all considered sacred writings, um, thought to be written between 250 BC and 70 AD, and they're over 1,000 years older than any other biblical text. And so what's interesting, though, is that most are written in a biblical Hebrew that points to sacred writing. So there were different, you know, what language of, of Hebrew that was going on at that time, but this was written in a biblical way, which points to the fact that these people, whoever was there, were keeping them as sacred, holy writings and not just common phrases with common talk. And one, one uh, objection some people have is that, uh, well... They, don't, they found 15 copies of Jubilees there, but they only found a little piece of a fragment. And they try to say, well, that's not a whole copy of Jubilees. Well, but it was, because it was rolled up in a scroll. They could only make out a little chunk of it, but it was a copy. And they did find 15 copies of that. And they found, what, six or seven copies of Enoch as well. So and what, what's amazing about Jubilees is that most of the time, Jubilees was actually found in the same scroll jars as Genesis. Like the two were together, like A and B. They were always found. Uh, most commonly together. So who wrote the scrolls? It's most commonly attributed to the Essenes. Uh, the writings of Philo, of Alexandria, and Josephus are also used to attribute the fact that the Dead Sea, Scroll, the Dead sea Scrolls were written by the Essenes. Uh, Pliny the Elder, uh, he's a renowned geographer, locates the Essenes near the Dead Sea, so people also use the fact that the Essenes were near this Dead Sea region. But with that thought, there's multiple problems that definitely arise. You know, for one, scene is, is uh, not known in the Hebrew language, and that uh, Josephus even states that the Essenes lived in various cities, but congregated in communal life dedicated to voluntary poverty, daily immersion, and asceticism. So that leads to a lot of uh, questions that really arise with, did the Essenes truly write this? So Philo said that they were monks and celibates <coughs> in area, and they were in the area for thousands of years. Pliny tells us that they were located near uh, Ein Gedi and says that they've been there for thousands of generations and are celibate. And Josephus said that they did not allow children near them and had few, if any, wives and were mostly celibate. So big problem with that is that the authors of the scrolls discuss the importance of wives. And if they were around for thousands of years, you know, <laughs> how does that really work? <laughs> Pliny locates them at Ein Gedi. Well, the scrolls were found five cities and 25 miles north of Ein Gedi. That's a far way to travel if you're placing your scrolls in, in a cave and then traveling back, especially in that time and, and climate. Josephus uh, saying that they did not have children. The scrolls speak very importantly of children and how to raise them. So again, it doesn't really seem to add up. The problem, again, with uh, placing them at Ein Gedi, which is the, the lower arrow on that map, and again, the idea that they were north, what, the, what uh, Pliny actually says is that they were above Ein Gedi in his writings. So people commonly say, okay, he was above Ein Gedi, they were above Ein Gedi, that must mean Qumran. Well, what people fail to realize is that above Ein Gedi, this is hard to see here on this, on this projection, there were actually ancient and sacred places where people were practicing and worshiping literally above Ein Gedi, talking about the geographical location in the mountains, not north of. If they were des describing these Essenes of Qumran, why not use a closer city like Jerusalem or Jericho, just to the north? Why choose something that's so far away? This was a renowned geographer of the time who wrote many geographical books and locations. Again, he was talking about above Ein Gedi with these Essenes, literally the fact that they were in the mountains worshiping above Ein Gedi. And that is a temple. Yeah, there's a, the photo of the temple that was literally found above Ein Gedi. So the word Essene is not used in any Jewish literature, including Mishnah, Talmud, New Testament, or the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and as we, we saw earlier, many call them Essenes, but the Essenes lived in Ein Gedi, not Qumran. 
and <clears throat> documents and temples, as Zach just showed, were found also in Ein Gedi. Uh, so the better fit is that the, the, the Essenes lived in Ein Gedi, and as we'll talk about in a minute, the sons of, of Zadok or Zadok lived in Qumran. So uh, again, we just threw this in here real quick. So the, the, the Nag Hammadi text, which often gets lumped in with the Dead Sea Scrolls, were found in Alexandria. So people want to uh, throw in the fact that the Dead Sea Scrolls are uh, Gnostic text, or say, say that they have a, a touch base in, in Gnosticism, they're, they're not even connected to the books that were found in, in Alexandria. There's no overlap there. Um, so there, you know, could this Essenes that they're referring to been the people in Alexandria? And if not the Essenes, then who are we finding at the location of Qumran? So the writers of the scrolls refer to themselves as the sons of Aaron, the sons of Zadok, the sons of righteousness, and the sons of light. And we see it's interesting in the New Testament, we see Paul and Yeshua referring to, to us and themselves as sons of light. Okay? And also, you know, Rachel Elior, who uh, I don't think we're going to talk about her in this particular presentation, but she's very well studied in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, she, you know, I just lost my thought. It's okay. Yeah, she, I, what she says, in, and she's often criticized for her theory of uh, that the sons of Zadok were the, the authors of these scrolls, and she has a, a really uh, interesting quote here. It says, usually my opponents have only read Josephus and other classical references to these Essenes. She said they should actually read the Dead Sea Scrolls for themselves because the proof is in the scrolls of who they are and not who others assume they are and claim that they are. Yeah, and that was actually remembered my point was that the writers themselves claim to be the sons of Zadok. They don't claim to be the Essenes anywhere. So why are we saying that they're the Essenes who wrote some really Gnostic things? Yep. So who are the sons of Zadok? In Ezekiel 44, we see that the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, they're just a refined line from Aaron that they are the ones who are keeping charge in the sanctuary during the millennial reign in Ezekiel's vision of that millennium. How cool is that? The fact that we could have unearthed documents from this refined group of Levi that were keeping the true ways and you, of and God. And you see on this slide here, it says that they kept the charge of my sanctuary when the sons of Israel went astray. And it says the same thing, essentially, in 4811, I believe. The exact same thing. So these guys did not go astray from the commandments. They didn't do that like the rest of Israel did. These are the righteous ones, and that's what we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. These are also the same exact priestly order that you see all throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls that you see in, in 1 Chronicles 24. It's also interesting to note is John the Baptist, right? That this is a, just a really cool passage. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah, the division of Abiah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, again, a righteous priest, and a, a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and they were both righteous. Well, that's a term we're going to see over and over and over again in the Dead Sea Scrolls, walking blamelessly in all of the commandments, statutes of the Lord. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So what's awesome about John the Baptist is that he is located in the canonical New Testament at the exact location of Qumran. Could he have been studying in the wilderness that we've always wondered? The wilderness being the caves of Qumran, studying the documents that were there prepared and put away for him. It says that these th things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So again, a little bit hard to see here on this map, but beyond the Jordan could only be in one place, especially when we look at in Matthew 3.3, that tells us that he was in the wilderness of Judah, uh, Judea, and he was re uh, proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. So beyond the Jordan and um, in, in the wilderness of Judea could only point to one location, and it points to right here. This is the, the, the Jordan Valley. This was the wilderness of Judea. If you take those two texts together, it only points to this one location, and it puts us at Qumran. What's also amazing to note is that the most ancient map that was found in this region, um, as we're seeing in this location, calls Bethabara and puts it again at that exact precise location. 
So when he was preaching and he was proclaiming this good news, could he have been studying from these exact scrolls? We, we believe so. So if not, the, the priests were not truly the righteous priests at the time of Yeshua, then what happened and in, in where did we go astray? So Antiochus Epiphanes, as we talked about earlier, he was the son of King Antiochus III the Great. And what he, he was the leader, the head of the Greek Seleucid Empire, okay? And according to Encyclopedia Britannica, it says the Seleucids adapted the Macedonian year to the Babylonian 19-year cycle. The Babylonian calendar was a lunisolar calendar with years consisting of 12 lunar months, each beginning when a new crescent moon was first sighted low on the western horizon at sunset, plus an intercalary month inserted as needed by decree. Now what does that sound like? I mean, seriously, what, you know? And so, if he changed, if he came in and made them stop keeping the Torah, it says in uh, the Maccabees that he burned every copy of the Torah he could. He would hang the, the baby boys that they circumcised around the mother's neck until they died. I mean, he, he hated them. He wouldn't let them keep the Sabbath. He hated the, the Torah. If he changed the Torah, and it says that this, this man was going to change times and law, what, if he changed the law to his laws and he changed the calendar, what calendar were they keeping before he instituted this one that seems a lot like the one that the Jews keep today? Yeah, so if Daniel truly is talking about this man of lawlessness, and he did change the time, he didn't really change it by a whole lot if it sounds exactly like the calendar uh, that is being kept today. So now for what you're all really here for, we're going to dig into some of the, the details of the calendar over these next 25 minutes, and uh, we're going to be quick. So again, find us afterwards, and uh, we'll, we'll go through some of these details with you. We really just want to hit the, hit the high points and set up uh, the background for who these are. So, so Jim Barfield, who's doing some amazing work over there right now, um, this is what he is saying um, in some of his discoveries at Qumran. So uh, look up Jim, Jim Barfield, the copperscrollproject.com, to really see some more about him. But he says, the calendars found at Qumran are intriguing. They are consistent, concise, complete, laying out each feast on the same day of the year, same day of the month, and same day of the week, simplifying the matter of when are the holidays celebrated. That is, for those attempting to reflect the image of God and happen to be trying to return to the biblical holidays. Again, note these words, that they are consistent, concise, and complete. Who does that sound like? That sounds like the God we yes. serve, that he is consistent, that he is concise, that he is complete. He is not the author of confusion. It shouldn't be so difficult for us to figure out, and, and we believe that this was preserved in this perfect way. So just some of the overview here. It's a 364-day calendar. It's a perfect 52 weeks, four seasons of 91 days. Uh, you determine the first day of the year, and the rest really plays itself out. Every Sabbath is on the same day of the week, month, every year. Every appointment, every appointed day is on the same day of the week and month every year. Each quarter of the year, months are exactly like the previous quarter. We're going to have a little side for that here in a second. Year always starts the fourth day of the week. Again, it's a precise, per perfect, consistent calendar. And that's what really led me to it, which is how simple and easy it was to understand so the year starts on the fourth day of the week, as Zach said. It's at the vernal equinox. It's usually around March 19th or 20th. That's when the equinox is. And in Genesis 1.14, again, it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And we know that, that Yeshua, Jesus, he's the light of the world. He is the door. The Dalit is the door. It's the fourth letter. Okay, and we're going to see in a second here, there's some other scripture, scriptures from Enoch which really fit into this well. So we knock at that door and it's open. It's just a really cool thing. But the, the year starting on the fourth uh, day of the week will we'll show you why it always starts on the fourth day of the week. And part of it is because the lights that determine our clock, our calendar, were created and put in place on the fourth day. So if we keep the same calendar year after year after year from that point on, it's always going to come back around and start on the fourth day again. It's, a beautiful, it's really just a beautiful picture of our Messiah, Yeshua. Um, it's a perfect and precise calendar, as, as Micah just said. It's 364 days, perfectly 52 weeks, which breaks down into seven days a week. What I loved about this calendar when I was studying it is that it always seems that the Sabbath counting of seven and the feast day counting cycle never seem to coincide. Why would God set a day apart, the seventh day, and never have it coincide perfectly with our counting of the calendar. 
with this calendar, we're always perfectly counted in seven. That, that thing that he gave us from the very beginning, work six days and on the seventh day rest, that, that very vital instruction that he gave us is something that we can do every single week, year after year after year. It's perfect and it's precise and it helps us in the counting of this calendar. This also divides into a perfect 13 weeks per season, 12 months of 30 days with four intercalary season days. Uh, they, they determine the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter. So we have this counting of 30, 30, 31, which we're gonna see that Enoch tells us exactly about. So Enoch tells us that each quarter of the year, and if you read through Enoch 72, in some versions I think it's either 71 or 73, because some versions have a different ordering of the chapters, but um, Enoch 72 and most of them, it tells you how long each month is. And so you have months one and two are 30 days, month three is 31, and every quarter is, is just a repeat of that. So when you start plugging all the calendar information that is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it matches perfectly with the book of Enoch. Again, could that be a reason why they were trying to conceal this book? And again, that, that doesn't mean that every detail in, that we find in Enoch is gonna be perfect because what do we talk about in Jeremiah? The, the lying uh, pen of the scribe. So just like there's errors in our canonical texts, yes, I, I just said that. I mean, I'm not getting zapped by, by lightning. There, there are errors that we have found in our, in our studies through Torah, things that translators have used in, in bias to, con to confuse us. And again, it could have been intentional or unintentional, but there are errors. If someone wants to hit the switch in the, in the back, these next couple of slides so we can kind of see a, a little bit better here, because they're really important for us to, to understand. So this is a, a breakdown of how each quarter of the year is exactly the same. And what it really does is, is highlight for us how we have months one, two, and three, follow a pattern, and then months four, five, and six, follow that same pattern, uh, seven, eight, nine, follow that same pattern, and 10, 11, 12, follow that same pattern. So we're seeing how this is all lined up so perfectly. Again, quarter after quarter after quarter, four times a year, it is repeating itself. It is a perfect and precise calendar. Um, so let's dig into to month by month how this calendar actually works. So month one um, is the uh, obviously when, when the year begins. And uh, so we're, what we're seeing here is how we have the, uh, the Rosh Hashanah, which is the biblical new year. It is on the day four of the week. And again, what we were, were talking about there, how, how exactly that begins, Passover on the, the 14th day. And what's really amazing is how we're gonna start seeing this moon play in uh, to how we determine this year. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a document called 4Q321. And in that document, it gives four years of when the new and full moons fell. And each of those four, or each of the months in those four years, they recorded, okay? And so if you look here, it says the first year, the full moon is on the fourth day of Gamul, on the first day of the first month. And as you can see on the, on the screen, there's a full moon on that first day, okay? That actually happened this year, okay? And if you, if you start reading through the Dead Sea Scrolls, compare through that, that scroll and compare what you, the data you find in there to what's actually happening in the heavens, okay? Over the last uh, 200 years, we have found it to be very consistent and precise. This pattern just keeps unfolding month after month after month. And, but I originally, I found it starting in 2013, there was a full moon on the first day of the first month. And then in uh, 2000, uh, well, we'll get into that in a minute, because I think that's further down the slide, but let's just move on. But this, so this is an actual excerpt from that scroll, and it matches perfectly where there's a full moon on the first day, and there's a new moon on the 17th day there. So the biggest confusion of this calendar is what you'll see here, the first fruits being outside of the week of unleavened bread. Again, we didn't have enough time to get into the details of that, but you know, please come find us and see us after, and, and we'd love to go over some of those details with you. So month two, again, we see this pattern start out. Uh, month one is on a Wednesday, month two is on a Friday, month three is on a, a Sunday beginning, and that pattern goes quarter by quarter by quarter. It's a, it's a beautiful cycle that we see. And again, in month two, if you had read the, the things on the side there, the full moon is on the, the Sabbath of Coats in the thir 13th day of the second month. There's also a new moon. And um, I think we might have messed something up on this one. So I think the moon's got messed up on this particular slide. But that's okay. Anyways, so 
if you follow through and you and you carefully lay the, the Dead Sea Scroll data month after month after month next to what's in timeanddate.com is what I use to pull all the moon data off of it, it matches perfectly. All the moons are in sync. Sometimes they'll be off by a day or two because of sighting, you know, one day one side or maybe a day the other side. But it's very consistent over 200 years. So they've got month, month, uh, month three here. Um, what's awesome about month three is that if, uh, if you look at Exodus 19, you'll see them talk about Shavuot, and you'll see how that plays out onto this calendar perfectly and precisely. And again, as we uh, kind of pointed out just briefly, Jubilees 15 and 16 tells us that uh, Shavuot is in the middle of the third month. This calendar always has it dead in the middle of the third month, never changing, never varying from that. And real quick, if you count backwards from the middle, from the 15th day of the third month, 50 days, because that's the Omer count, you always fall on the 26th day. And if, and if we're gonna, um, I wanted to say this on the, the slide for the first month, we're gonna be doing a beach chat Q&A on um, Saturday, I think it's 6.30, I think it's 6.30. Um, PM. PM. PM, yep. So if you have any questions, definitely, I mean, find us afterwards or come to the, to the beach chat and let's dig into this together. We'd be happy to go over it with you. Yep. So again, here's month four. We're just gonna go through these months here real quickly because we still got a, a few slides we wanna cover about the moons. Um, this is how month four lays out. Again, we're repeating that cycle of beginning uh, the first day of the month on the Wednesday. Five, we see, uh, again, <coughs> out on the first day of the month on a Friday. This first fruits of the new wine, um, that was new to me, but you know, as soon as you shatter that glass, you see first fruits start appearing everywhere. There's fruit, first fruits of the barley, first fruits of the wheat, there's first fruits of the wine, and first fruits of the oil. You'll see how many times that begins appearing in scripture, the, the four first fruits that the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about. And what's amazing again is if you read the Septuagint translation, the golden calf, one of our favorite stories, you'll see Moses say something very, very interesting about this specific feast. Month six, again, we're seeing this pattern start off uh, day one and play out uh, through, uh, through this perfect cycle. And one thing you'll see as you watch where the moons fall, as you can see that this is a new moon here, right? And they're not starting the months, okay? And this, this data matches Enoch's account of how the sun and moon work together exactly, exactly perfect. So the moon is precise, the moon is, is, is perfect as well. Again, it's just not for us to determine the beginning of the month. Uh, month seven, which we're quickly approaching here, again we see how this plays out. Yom Teruah will always be on the on a Wednesday and it's a, a perfect uh, foreshadowing of the, the spring feast. The spring feast and the fall feast are perfect how they line up on these calendars. It's, it's truly just really amazing to see, again, how this all plays out. So we're gonna keep motoring through this here. We've got a little bit more to cover as we get through. Month eight, again, just completing this cycle from Friday, nine, uh, beginning back on a Sunday, 10. This is now getting into the, the fourth quarter here as we get 10, 11, and 12. The Sunday, Friday for the 11th month, and again, the last Sunday uh, for the 12th month. So where do we come up with this 364 days only? And how is this matching what was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Enoch 82.7 tells us the year is completed in 364 days. Jubilee 6.32 says, And command you, the children of Yashirel, Israel, that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and these will constitute a complete year. The Dead Sea Scrolls tells us in uh, 4Q394, and the year is complete, 364 days. Again, could these be why they kept these non-canonical books determined by Jewish Pharisees who were observing a lunar-based calendar, and they got rid of them? And here's another thing we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It says, on that, on that day, Noah went forth from the ark at the end of a full year of 364 days. You know, it's not in our canon, but that's what they were saying happened. Another beautiful thing that's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls were the, uh, the, the Sabbath Psalms. And it's three, it says 364 Psalms to sing before the altar, daily perpetual sacrifice for all the days of the year, 52 songs for the Sabbath. Again, these, song, these Psalms written by David work perfectly and precisely that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls for this fitting calendar. And that's the amazing thing that, that transcends the Dead Sea Scrolls is that it doesn't matter you know, which section that you're reading in, this idea of the calendar flows throughout the entire Dead Sea Scrolls, and it is an integral part of the, of the life that they were living. 
So Enoch 72 starts off with, this is the first law of the luminaries. The sun and the light arrive at the gates of heaven, which are on the east and on the west of it at the western gates of heaven, and first proceeds forth that great luminary, which is called the sun. So he's telling us this is how the year starts. It begins with the sun proceeding forth. Okay, so if that's how the year starts, then why are we, you know, chasing moons to start our year? It's a beautiful picture of our Messiah following the light, chasing the light. So this passage here from Enoch 72 as well describes the vernal equinox. It says the sun goes forth from that second gate and sets in the west, but returns to the east and rises in the east in the third gate. 31 days, setting in the west of heaven. At that period, the night becomes shortened. There's nine parts, and the night is equal with the day. This is also nine parts, because it's equal. The year is precisely 364 days, okay? The next day is the first day of your year, okay? And the way these gates work, I'm going to try to explain this. In fact, I'm going to do it on the next slide. If you want to, yeah, look to that. So, well, you can't see it on that one either. Look to the next one quickly. Yeah. Okay, so the way these gates work is... You have, to the south, you have gate one, and then it starts going off two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, this is a moon, but we're gonna imagine it's the sun. So what that just described is, is the, the, it came from the second gate into the third gate, because the sun just slowly moves like this to the summer solstice, and then it comes back like this to the winter one. And the equinoxes are always right in the middle between the third and the fourth gate, okay? So it, it comes up from the second into the third, and then it's, the equinox happens, and then it crosses over into the fourth gate, and that's the beginning of your year. So the, the photo to, to the right of this here is showing those gates. It's showing the, the sun here in those beautiful gates, just as Enoch describes. These suns are moving perfectly through those gates, which is amazing. For everybody here who's not a biblical cosmologist, just ignore this slide here with me. <laughs> <laughs> so the faithful witness, it says he, he made the moons for the seasons. Everybody always sends this to me. Psalm 104, 19. He made the moons for the seasons, Zach. He made the moons for the appointed times. This is exactly, you know, that's why we're following the moon-based calendar. But they never read the second part of this, this verse. It says the sun knows the place of its setting. Well, that's very important because how do we determine the equinox if we're not citing it there's a second witness we do everything by two or three witnesses right if we don't cite that the, the the equinox on our on our sundial there's another way to witness it and it's the moon the faithful witness enoch 74 5 tells us on stated months it changes its setting and on stated months the progress of each in two in two the moon sets with the sun in those two gates which are in the midst, the third and the fourth gate. It goes forth for seven days and makes its circuit. So during the beginning of the year, when we're trying to determine when it is, if you watch the sun set, and then you watch the moon move through the sky, it is setting in the exact same <laughs> gate. So that is what Psalm 104 is talking about. The sun knows the place of its setting. That's the witness for how we begin the year. It's telling us that perfectly. He made the moons for the seasons because it's the second witness to the sun. It's showing us a pin, perfect pinpoint of when that year is to begin. So Enoch 74, 13 and 16 says, the moon brings on all the years exactly, just like what Zach just described. And then it goes on to say, the year then becomes truly complete according to the station of the moon and the station of the sun, which rise in the gates, rise and set in them for 30 days. And then we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls it says to show it from the east and to cause it to shine in the middle of heaven in the foundation of creation from evening to morning there is a full moon on the fourth day in the week of the sons of Gamal in the first month of the first year. So it's, it's describing the same thing it's saying the moon shines all night and then it's going to set in the in the same place. So it's, it's, there's two things the moon does is one it's full on the first day of the first year of that of a seven year cycle there's a full moon okay that's one sign and the second sign it gives is that it sets in the same gate as the sun at the equinox and so what is a seven year cycle well that, that's how we determine our our sweet years and then we determine our jubilee years and so the moon is an integral part when you see a, a new moon a full moon at the beginning of the year well that tells you what year you are in your seven year counting 
So when we follow the moon precisely at the beginning of the year, it's going to give us the, the count for the years too. See, everyone's so concerned with, with going month by month and determining when this moon is, but we're failing to see the, the bigger picture in all of it. So again, if, if you dig through the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't have time to, to dig through all of these, it outlines these perfectly for us. It tells us when they were sighting the moons year after year after year, seeing the same pattern. And again, this is just an excerpt from the scrolls which are, are showing us all of, the, all, all of the calculations that they were finding and observing and, and preserving for us. The same with the Sabbaths in the scrolls. They were showing that each Sabbath is on the same day of the week, month, every year. It is perfect and it is precise and they outline for us for this in the scrolls too. And again, the priestly order, which we don't have time to get into today, the priestly order cannot be followed and determined on any other calendar. The priestly order is so perfect with what we are, are in, in needing to preserve. Again, the, the other calendars fail to preserve this. Um, flow through this yeah, slide yeah. here. We can, we can go through it. We touched on that earlier. The role of the stars, and we still have so much to learn about the stars, but it is really interesting how the stars play out into this too. Yes. Um, so real quickly as we, as we wrap up here, some of the most common objections that we meet are, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Enoch in, in Jubilees, they're not legitimate. They are not scriptural. We throw them out. We're just challenging you to read them for yourselves. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and lead you. Study those. Don't listen to what we're saying. Don't listen to what anybody else is saying, but truly just study those for yourselves. Um, the idea of, of, of new moons, um, the fact that there's, there's so much tradition that is upheld and we need to follow. And, and some say this, that we won't know the ca true calendar until Jesus Yeshua returns. And that very well might be the case, is that a reason that we should stop? We're not going to be in a perfect kingdom following a perfect king until he returns. Does that mean we stop trying? Right. The glory of kings to search out a matter. Amen. And the most common was that the calendar has changed over time. Do we serve a changing God? Do we serve a God that changes, or do we serve one that is precise? So here's a few things people say. Some have said that change, time change at the flood. Others say it changed when the sun stood still for Joshua. Others, when uh, the sun went backward or the shadow went backwards on the steps for Hezekiah. But Scripture doesn't tell us that. It doesn't say the calendar changed anywhere. And it doesn't make any sense that Yah would give his people a calendar. Say, follow this calendar. And then, literally, right as they're going into the land to take it, he destroys the calendar by changing the moon. And that they're messing up the calendar, messing up the luminaries, and now they don't match because he stopped the sun and the moon and the stars kept going is what some have said. I don't think that makes any sense personally. I think he would he gave them a calendar and it still works today. And we're going to see it here in just a couple of slides what the scripture actually says about it. So Genesis 8:22 tells us while the earth remains, seed time, harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. Again, that sounds like it's pretty perpetual to me. Uh, second, Ezra 437. By measure has he measured the times, and by number has he numbered the times, and he does not move or stir them until the said measure be fulfilled. So again, has God's calendar changed? It says, all the days of the earth, seed time and harvest, uh, should never cease. Cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night should not change in their order, nor cease forever. Jubilees 6.4. And the final one here, Enoch 69, 28-30. Just says, by this the oath, the sun and the moon complete their progress, never swerving from the command to them forever and ever. By this oath, the stars complete their progress, and when their names are called, they return and answer forever and ever. So Enoch 72, 6 <coughs> and 42 says, first proceeds uh, forth that great luminary. We read that earlier, the sun, and then the year is completed precisely in 364 days. Then he says in Enoch 78, he says that the moon, at the time of the going forth during three months, it appears 30 days each, and 29 days each. Okay, so if you, as Zach said, 29 and a half days is the average, that's 354 days. And, it, and if you, so if you put all that together, Enoch's telling you the sun has this many, the moon has this many, they're different. So if they're Enoch, not the same yeah, from Enoch, the beginning. If Enoch truly is inspired, <laughs> right. Then there was never a change. They, you know, people, uh, there's so many teachers out there will say that the, the sun, the moon, the stars used to all be on the same pattern, and it got destroyed, it got changed over time. Well, Enoch's telling us from the beginning that they were never on the same pattern. There are two different ways of, of calculating and, and telling time. Um, and again, we'll, we're going to move through these uh, last two here just for just for the sake of time yep. and end you with this. It says uh, another quote from Jim Barfield again, who's doing some great work. 
um, over there in, in Israel right now in the, in the Qumran area. It says, although there are many topics from the Copper Scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls that grab the attention of those searching for answers, that we're going to begin or we're going to end with a simple and basic need and emphasized in both the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that is timing. Because time should be perfect and time should be precise if we should serve a perfect and precise God. We just want to put up here a big thank you to a lot of the people that uh, have helped us along this journey and uh, stuff that we've been able to really glean and some insight from. And so we've just really, really enjoyed digging into this topic and studying it for it. So what we've done is we've taken about six hours uh, worth of uh, presentation. <laughs> we condensed it down to three hours for the, the wonderful Waywalk conference. And then we took those three hours and condensed it again to a one hour presentation. So this is really just to, to wet the palate and to uh, you know, give a little slight nudge into the, the, the calendar topic study. So if, if this is something uh, that intrigues you, you know, please feel free to, to reach out to us and, and to connect with us. But most importantly, just dig into this topic on your own. You know, question everything, challenge everything, and most importantly, test everything to the scriptures. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks.